Welcome back to the Cineposium podcast, where each week members or collaborators of Cineposium curate films for remote viewing and then talk about those films on this podcast. This week's episode is a special memorial episode for Christopher Plummer, an actor whose career has spanned seven decades in the film industry. Born in 1929, he died recently in 2021. During his life, Plummer was recognized for his performances in film, television, and theater, having made his Broadway debut in 1954. Plummer has received various awards for his work, including an Academy Award, two Primetime Emmys, two Tony Awards, a Golden Globe, a Screen Actors Guild Award, and a British Academy Film Award. He is one of few performers to have received the Triple Crown of Acting, which is a term in the entertainment industry used to refer to actors who have won a competitive Academy Award, Emmy Award, and Tony Award in acting categories. And he is the oldest person to win an acting award when he received a nomination at the age of 88 for All the Money in the World. Today we record this episode of the Cineposium podcast to remember Christopher Plummer's acting in three notable films. The classic musical film The Sound of Music from 1965, Ryan Johnson's Knives Out from 2019, and David Fincher's The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo from 2011. Enjoy the conversation. So The Sound of Music might be the movie I watched most with my grandma who like raised me on all those classic late golden age into the 70s movie musicals. She just would have, she had a, a chest of drawers full of uh, VHS tapes. Back in the old days, that, that was analog media, it wasn't digital. And we'd just watch a movie every night and we'd always end up watching Sound of Music a lot. And so like, I have this weird relationship with this movie where it struck me like maybe 10 years ago that like I really enjoy this movie, but Christopher Plummer and Julie Andrews have like no chemistry. It it's weird. It's just like like there's all this like coded, like, yes, this is romantic. They're looking at each other in weird, awkward times where it doesn't make sense why you would look at someone. And it's just like I just I don't get it. And like it, the, on the um, make all, and all the making of stuff for this movie, there's all this talk about like how Plummer like kept refusing the role, refusing the role, and um, eventually he's like fine, but like the character in the script sucks. I'm going to you, you're going to have to work with me to beef him up and to do stuff, and like overall, like I like his performance as Captain Von Trapp because he's this very like it's it's weird the, the whole notion of like the, there's not even like a lot of german people in this movie it's a lot of british and americans playing austrian and german so like there's no like idea of authenticity to this movie at all but like he's very kind of like just this very stoic classic era masculinity just doesn't talk doesn't really emote and then all of a sudden he has this sweet little guitar voice, but like guitar song of Edelweiss, but that's not even him singing, that's Billy Lee singing, and which is makes it even more awkward when they sing um, something good in the um, gazebo. It, it's, it doesn't, like they have to do those dialogue parts. And if you look, it just, it's Lee is overdubbed in that portion too. It's just, nothing about that song works and they made it for the movie. Uh, it's just, but like, I'm kind of fascinated by his performance because there's a certain amount of like, like wary dread there of like, I don't know how to be a dad to all my children. All I know is how to be a Naval officer. And so that's how I'm going to cope with the loss of my wife is to be emotionally distanced and just probably ruin my children's lives. But like, it's his final, like the, the final performance of Edelweiss, which 
like that song isn't really even a real like Austrian or German folk song. The people of Salzburg hate it. And yet they also lean into its commercializations because you know what, people have to get paid. And just like, just that whole like contradiction, the artifice in his performance, I think I really like. It's, it's fascinating, but like in that final performance, which I find really powerful of like this, this condemnation of like, no, of like Austrian pride and like, fuck the Nazis. Like Billy Lee's performance, he gets his voice to crack um, in this really great way where this like emotion actually seems to come out of this man's face and voice for once. And it just, it's, it's this kind of really, kind of like really wonderful moment of vulnerability. That's really nice. And then the, the final showdown with Rolf is this really great, just like plumber running, just circles around, um, who played Rolf? It was uh, Daniel Truheitel, Truheitel. The guy, like just running circles around him, like this is what a movie star looks like and does. And so yeah, it's, Oh, it's a fascinating performance that's not very good in a lot of ways. But what are your guys' like thoughts on Sound of Music? Yeah, I think I think like you, I was introduced to Sound of Music at a pretty young age. I mean, it wasn't my grandma, it was my mom. But I mean, I would say like, I mean, maybe I'm shooting like too broad, painting a broad stroke, but I think at least for like millennial and up, I would say this is probably everyone's introduction to Christopher Plummer. Like I can't recall any early Christopher Plummer work besides Sound of Music. And I agree with you. Like, I think at, even at a young age, I was like, this guy has the personality of cardboard. <laughs> like I didn't particularly ever care for Captain Von Trapp. I just thought of him as a human who existed. <laughs> like, I mean, like, you know, obviously we're supposed to sympathize more with Maria and I was always confused why she was ever attracted to him. And I was just like, they exist and they're heterosexual. So there you go. <laughs> like you have to pair them together. So I think, yeah, it's a reflecting on it is very weird. I just sort of accepted it, I guess, just because it's a movie and they made it happen. But yeah, I don't know. I haven't revisited Sound of Music since a kid. So I don't, I have very nice memories of watching it with my mom. I think like Christopher Plummer honestly just existed in that point. And I just didn't register him maybe for better, I don't know, for better for getting this performance of his. But yeah, I, I think Christopher Plummer to me will always be that like thespian actor who just then transferred to the screen and honestly did an amazing job with it. But yeah, this one is just very confusing, especially because this is definitely the first time I watched Plover and just like did not care for his character at all. I think it's interesting to kind of hear the um, stories of early interactions with Christopher Plummer through The Sound of Music because I, I was exposed to The Sound of Music very late in life. Um, that's just not like the style of film that my family is into <laughs> and like my my dad does not like the sound of music i had seen the sound of music actually in conjunction with lord of the rings in the early 2000s and the only reason why i remember this is because my dad had come to me um one afternoon and he was like i want to watch a really long movie and i was like okay what are the options and he was like we're gonna watch either the sound of music or lord of the rings and um, we ended up watching, <laughs> I know, right, but it's really a choice, but I guess like if you're looking for long films, it's, <laughs> you know, you don't have a lot of options. Um, and we ended up watching The Sound of Music, because I was like, oh, I've never heard of that, what is that, we'll put it on. Um, didn't like it, let me tell you. That's <laughs> I mean, when you like are, are thinking like The Sound of Music and then Lord of the Rings, you're like, oh, maybe it's like Lord of the Rings, it's some massive epic or something. <laughs> it's kind of not. <laughs> I mean, I guess it is like a musical of epic proportion for the time period, um, but it is not Lord of the Rings. <laughs> um, yeah. So needless to say, I didn't really enjoy it. Um, what was interesting to me though, was that like I had been exposed to Sound of Music as a musical prior to that. There's um, a Vin Diesel film. <laughs> Are you talking about the pacifier? Yes, there is a Vin <laughs> film called The Pacifier. <laughs> I have no knowledge of this, and I, 
I love Vin Diesel. How do oh I... my God. It's, I want to say it was like my first Vin Diesel movie because I just was not there for the Fast and Furious franchise, but. <laughs> I, I think it was also the first Vin Diesel film that I remember as well, because I, I also I didn't see Fast and Furious until much later. Mike, all you need to know, it's, it's Vin Diesel, who is like some Navy SEAL, somehow gets roped into a job of taking care of like five or more children who are extremely like troublemakers. Essentially, it's Sound of Music, but with Vin Diesel and like super secret spy shenanigans <laughs> instead of nazis it's, it's very interesting um because like there's like an inordinate amount of references to the sound of music throughout that so like um the the family that um Vin diesel was assigned to protect is the Plummer family um spelled in the same name as like christopher Plummer. um I, I don't think that the the name of the dead husband is actually christopher Plummer, but the last name is Plummer and they performed the sound of music as part of that film and i had no context for that until i had seen <laughs> well wasn't there like a whole plot point where like he was afraid that the boyfriend or the son was a nazi because he had like a nazi costume <laughs> and it turned out he was just playing um i forgot this character's name uh liesel's boyfriend yeah nice. well yeah yeah, that, that, that was like a whole plot point where like he he's like you know because he's trying to investigate this family because they have ties to some a uh, super secret paramilitary project or something like that. And so he's going through all of their stuff very secretly and finds that the, the oldest son um, has, I think he's like the only son, no, they have a couple of boys. Um, the oldest son has Nazi paraphernalia inside of his bedroom that he's like hidden away. And um, then he's like confronts him about it. And it turns out that he's just like, he didn't want anyone to know that he was in an amateur production of The Sound of Music playing the, the boyfriend of Nazi. And it becomes like a plot point where like Vin Diesel helps him realize his like, his dreams of becoming a stage performer by helping him perform an, as a Nazi in The Sound of Music. This is 100% not plumber related, but this just brought me an entire flashback to the like song that played key role. <laughs> Is it the Peter Panda dance? The Peter Sorry. Panda dance. Yes, it's a great film. It's a great film, and you should watch that if you're looking for something adjacent to Christopher Plummer, but not actually. <laughs> I mean, Alex, you bring up a great point because I did not realize that the pacifier was basically the sound of music, but with Vin Diesel. But anyway, <laughs> I do agree that the pacifier is quite enjoyable compared to Sound of Music as a family-friendly thing of showing how a military guy can become a warm and cuddly father figure. Yeah, but I guess I guess to get like back on track with specifically Christopher Plummer <laughs> and, and not go on a, a related uh, little bit of a rant. Um, like I said, like the first film that I had seen him in was actually not um, the Sound of Music, which is the first film that like many people are introduced to Christopher Plummer through. Um, I had actually seen him first in 1975's Return of the Pink Panther, um, in which he plays the notorious bandit Sir Charles Lytton. And that is a role that I would say is very adjacent to the acting in The Sound of Music, but works way better. Um, like the Return of the Pink Panther I describe as almost like a little bit of like a wonky um, comedic Bond film. And in this, essentially, Christopher Plummer plays the equivalent of the Bond villain. And that acting that he like performs within the sound of music of like this very um, stern, no nonsense, yet kind of like suave guy. He's like reprising that role in Return of the Pink Panther. And it just kind of works a lot better, I think, in that context of like he has stolen some diamonds and some gems and is trying to thwart the police um, with no romantic subplot. <laughs> and and like a hundred percent less singing, <laughs> but it's it's interesting too because in in that role, even though I think like he's absolutely fantastic, um, when you think of like Return of the Pink Panther, that's not Christopher Plummer's film. That's Peter Sellers' film. Like it, it's it's for Peter Sellers, and so I think that like that's important to note at like this point in his acting career as well. That like I feel like the roles that he's doing the best are the roles that he's. Um, it's not necessarily like his front film, which I think is unusual as well, that you can have um, 
like an actor who who can play a secondary like that but like not outshine the majority of the cast even though he's like irrevocably famous and fantastic of a performer you know yeah i think i mean like you you say that and it makes me i mean i'll bring up like knives out right uh he's playing a dead character right um he plays harlan oh what's his full name holland thromby who's a mystery novelist uh he dies mysteriously supposedly a suicide they bring in um they bring in a private detective Renaud blanc <laughs> aka daniel craig in a like kentucky very exaggerated kentucky accent but <laughs> i mean and even though he's dead and and his only scenes are essentially played out through flashbacks of other characters recalling their last conversations with him i think he really shined i don't know in this in this way that as a supplemental character you really did get a full understanding of who he was like he was this mystery author who obviously cared for his children but realized that his wealth his wealth has spoiled them to the point that <laughs> he can no longer bear to like cover up their mistakes and or keep providing for their spoiled lifestyles and unfortunately that gets him killed but like I think it's kind of amazing when I when I rewatch Knives Out to just watch and like realize how little screen time he has yet feel like he completely was a full-fledged character even though like you know you only know him in relation to everyone else but yeah I think he did a fantastic job in Knives Out and I think um what his last nomination was for all the money in the world at least for the oscars which again like that was a whole switcheroo he wasn't even supposed to have that role uh once they kicked kevin spacey out they put him in and i think they had to really talk him into actually doing it but even then like he got an oscar nomination he rocked it as getty again this like very cold heartless father figure which is interesting that like he has a sort of through line of <laughs> these kinds of characters but he plays them really well yeah like if we if we look at the movies we brought it's basically him slowly self-actualizing as the stern dad who's like oh i need to like be a father and help fix my kids even if that means by cutting them all off <laughs> and him and anna diarmas playing go like that little sequence and then him losing badly that like that felt like something people who've known each other a long time do or just like around each other which is a very strange concept to think about during covid times <laughs> but um like that like there's a real like humanity in that moment that then just tees you into when he dies like five minutes later and it's just it's a really small moment it's 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 just a small nice little moment yeah yeah or like even i guess spoiler alert for knives out like when you when it gets to the sort of reveal of the fact that you know um anna damarmus's character um martha like turns out that martha actually never poisoned um harlan with morphine that he actually was going to be perfectly fine had they waited the like 10 minute thing and inevitably he killed himself i guess quote unquote for nothing but like you know you really do feel that pain of not only just the fact that she's carried this guilt of uh thinking that she killed him but also just you know you kind of feel like damn like had he just waited like a few more minutes they could have realized he wasn't poisoned and he would have survived and none of this like crap would have happened but I don't know I think in a way it's sort of both you feel bad that he died but at the same time I guess it's it's sort of poetic right like he was going to cut off his children he died very theatrically and dramatically by slitting his own throat but <laughs> I think yeah it's it's sort of again you feel bad for this character's death even though you don't actually get to know the character at all I guess directly you only know him through the memories yeah like it's a real thankless role in these kinds of movies because he's just the body and then like oh now okay like oh that's 
That's such a good movie that also feels like it's it came out like years ago at this point. I mean, it was three years ago, not that far back. It, it, we're, we're barely a month into 2021. <laughs> 2019 isn't that far away, but it feels to me. That is true. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I don't know, I think it's one of his more recent roles, I guess. Now it's good. Like, it, it's, it's sort of, yeah, a nice little capstone just to who he was as an actor. And I think I think like you know both Mike and Alex you guys have said that it takes a lot to be that kind of actor who can play a supporting actor role well and not outshine it given just like how easy it is and I think that's just like the craft of being a supporting actor I I mean I don't know I can't think of I, I personally can't recall any like lead acting roles that he's had besides I guess Sound of Music yeah, absolutely. And um, I like that you speak to kind of like the timeliness of, of Knives Out because it, it did come out um, uh, towards the end of 2019. And this is one of his his last roles. Um, so we've gone from essentially the one of the first roles that we kind of recognize him widely in to one of his last roles. There's only um, two films that have come out since Knives Out that um, he's made an appearance in the last full measure. Um, which came out also in 2019 after Knives Out. Um, and he has a um, posthumous appearance as a voice actor for a 2021 film uh, called Heroes of the Golden Masks, which is an uh, animated film. And so I'm kind of like looking at a, a film that's kind of like towards the end of his set of roles, but like not quite. So it's like this guy has like a massive filmography. Like Christopher Plummer's been in so many movies and it's it's like almost like a near ridiculous of films that he's been in um and i think like even like just like looking at the list of films that he's in just like remembering these roles and knowing that like they're memorable and that so many of these films are are worth the rewatch it's like very difficult to pick um what type of film to even begin to select to kind of characterize what his acting career was right um, so I kind of picked like a, a, a little bit of like a controversial one. I picked the, the girl with the grandma tattoo, the 2011 one. Um, and the reason why I picked that is because I felt that it worked really, really well in conversation with both um, the sound of music being that he plays um, a staunch anti-Nazi character in that and Knives Out in which he plays kind of like this patriarch of family, right? Um, and I think that his role in The Girl with Dragon Tattoo kind of combines those two roles but in a, in a very different way. Um, so in the context of The Girl with Dragon Tattoo, Christopher Plummer plays uh, Henrik Weinberg, um, who is a wealthy businessman in Sweden. Uh, he launches, you know, this extensive investigation into his family's affairs and hires uh, <laughs> Daniel Craig to do so. Um, and I, I think that that sounds, you know, a little bit, a, a little bit close to Knives Out. Like <laughs> Knives Out was like the family-friendly version of the Gold Dragon Tattoo. You have both uh, Christopher Plummer and, um, and Daniel Craig there uh, trying to solve a murder or a death of some kind. Um, that is not what it seems. Um, so he, Christopher Plummer is playing Henrik Weinberg, and he, in one of like the most, I, I'd say like memorable scenes in the film is, uh, he, it's a monologue, um, and it is Christopher Plummer uh, as Henrik Weinberg explaining what happened to uh, his missing ward, um, Harriet, who is the, the kind of like, her disappearance serves as like the catalyst for the mystery in the film. Uh, and he has like a couple of like really good quotes from that where he goes like, you will be investigating thieves, misers, and bullies, the most detestable collection of people you will ever meet, my family. I need your help. I'm doing, doing what? Officially assisting with my memoirs. But what you really be doing is solving a mystery by doing what you do so well. Your recent uh, legal mishap notwithstanding. You will be investigating thieves, misers, bullies, the most detestable collection of people that you will ever meet. My family. <laughs> His face is so good. And and he just like, the, the fact I think that he can have this on-screen presence that is so just strong, even when just talking, right? I mean, he's physically present in the film, 
Um, but I think that the, this monologue, um, which is overlaid with flashback, it's mostly not watching him talk. It's, you know, the sequence of events as he's telling them being played out across the screen and we're not seeing him very much. Um, I think that that like his voice also is being something super iconic to um, include in the film. We're like, we don't have to watch him act if his voice does the acting for him and can do that with such like, oh, it's so good, it's so good. And again, like he has just like this lingering presence throughout the film where even if he doesn't um, appear for very long, he's, he doesn't appear for long at all. I mean, it's not, Henrik Wengler's film, it's it's Mikhail Volkvist and, and Lisbeth Slander's film, it's theirs. And it's like, and yet he's there the whole time. Like they're kind of like, oh, where's Christopher Plummer? Like, how is he responding to this? And it's it's yeah, just just an absolutely fantastic, um, fantastic role. Um, and I also I, I want to talk also like you know, going into more of his like voice acting work to transition with that as well. Up the film up. The Pixar film up that makes everyone cry. He played the antagonist in that, uh, Charles Moots, right? He's got, he's got like he's got like all these like fantastic roles. It's like, what do you like? I don't even know how to begin with, you know. Yeah, just even beginning to to address a guy who you can recognize in a film by his voice alone, even if you're not seeing him, and then who can like be so widely recognized even when he is in a physical film appearing with so little screen time, you know. I, I just kind of wanted to just point out a, a fun little entry in his filmography that I forgot he was in, but like the uh, un, unloved uh, Dracula 2000, wherein he played Abraham Van Helsing. <laughs> and just like, like Christopher Plummer was a good working actor. Like, I'm not like, like people are like, oh, working actor, that means you did a lot of stuff. Like he did a lot of stuff, like, and he just was, he, he, he gave it that air of prestige because like this is a terrible 2000s movie with young um, Gerard Butler as Judas Dracula. And you, then you're just like, oh, Christopher Plummer's on scene. This is like fantastic. And like, he just is like giving it that Obi-Wan, like old British guy air of quality. It was like, I am a theatrical trained actor I can do the Queen's English and Shakespeare's the only real stuff, but you're paying me and I'm going to give you my prestige and capital. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I was just going to say, isn't this around the time when he does Star Trek like six? I think, that, I think that's like, when did he do Star Trek six? Hold on. He did Star Trek six, 1991. So uh, uh, nine years earlier. And the next year he's in a little part in Malcolm X. Like, he went places. I mean, he was also the voice that, he was the narrator for the Madeline cartoon. I don't know. <laughs> like, if you really want to throw it back to like childhood, like, I think he like was nominated for an Emmy or something for it. But like, yeah, I think it's just sort of like, he creeps out of the most random films. And I don't know, it's just like, he did, such a good job about standing out in the films that he knew were good and then like just taking the money and and really standing by just for the ones that were not so good i mean like i have to say even like the bad films right so like dracula 2000 which is like objectively a bad film <laughs> it's a fun film in that it's really interesting it's at least like if he was going to do you know a version of dracula you would expect either that he would be doing um, a very like tight to adaptation version of like the book, right? He'd be doing it on the stage, um, or he would be doing Dracula 2000, which is in part um, <laughs> like a story of like early Christianity. Like Count Dracula is the character of Judas Iscariot, who like is the one that betrays Jesus, and um, <laughs> it's like Christopher Plummer plays Abraham Van Helsing and Matthew the Apostle, <laughs> like. There's a lot going on there, and it's like I'm sure that he read that script and was like, "This is the most interesting thing I've ever seen happen to Dracula in my life. Let's do it." <laughs> like he has like this great sense of humor that like I can't imagine that he would take these roles and like not appreciate them to some extent. <laughs> and like he was Mike Wallace in The Insider the year before, like underrated Michael Mann film like central to that movie and then he's like also guys Dracula 2000 I have that coming out Be also, the like the, 
also like the next year he's in a beautiful mind like it's it's just pretty astounding how he can like yo yo i mean like he's, he's transcending like all genres all forms of like um uh live action to animated to, to 3d animation to um like high highly regarded films so like really low culture quote unquote films um, he's done, you know, horror, he's done sci-fi, he was in 12 Monkeys, he was in um, Star Trek VI, he's done uh, rom-coms, like, I mean, like, I, I don't think, like, you could ask as an actor for, like, a more varied career, right? I mean, like, we kind of, we kind of joke that he's always playing, like, this very staunch man in the background, or, like, a secondary role in which he is, like, this, um, this father figure, but, like, really, he's doing this in so many different ways, in like so many different genres and so many types of films that it's like there's no way that like he would ever get bored of the role or at least if I was in this position I, I wouldn't have because gosh like I, I would definitely play like Brad Pitt's doctor father or whatever the heck that role was in 12 Monkeys I didn't I didn't understand 12 Monkeys <laughs> disclaimer so don't don't take that summary as like legitimate I don't I don't know what happened to that movie I just know <laughs> he plays the character a taste of the Brad Pitt it's fine <laughs> I mean, it like sucks because I know he was in talks or he was about to start filming King Lear and I'm pretty sure he was cast to play King Lear, which just like, I don't know, it just sucks because he was such a lauded, um, you know, uh, an actor of the theater, and I can't, a thespian to say the least, but you know, he won two Tony Awards. He's, yeah, he was someone who was highly trained in playing Shakespearean roles and the fact that I think this is I think this was his first like Shakespeare film adaptation it just sort of just kind of sucks that we won't be able to see that just because I would have loved to see him play King Lear yeah I mean like in, in regards to like his, his stage presence and his, his Shakespearean acting in particular he's got some just amazing like Shakespeare rules and, and um, some of them you can get recordings of um you can find those kind of like lurking around every so often um like he's got ones where he like in from like the 80s these are like 80s versions um here he plays like Macbeth and you're like oh my gosh like wow like the holy crap like <laughs> and, and they're just like so good and like so like you can tell that like this is where he really excelled and I think that like there is just such this like huge divide between Hollywood and um, Hollywood adaptations of Shakespeare that yeah it's it's really sad that like it wasn't ever actualized to be able to see him on say like the small screen you know or like the big screen or like whatever we want to call the television relation to to the theater stage as um, as a as a starring Shakespeare role because that's that's where that's where he comes from that that's why it was always like surprising to me to learn about his background as a Shakespeare actor where he is always the title role like there are very few plays that he was in where he was not the title role um and you see the translated onto film where he's um a secondary role or a third role and basically every film that he's in it's it's so different he was just one of those kind of guys that you just were like always it like in retrospect we're like yeah he was in a lot of stuff we watched like i didn't know that about madeline but like now that like i think about it I'm like oh yeah that does sound like christopher Plummer. did any of you guys see beginners recently like i haven't in like years so but, like i remember him being like actually really pretty good in that and like that movie overall being surprisingly kind of like good <laughs> for the subject matter and the time it came out i was like oh this isn't totally cringeworthy i mean it's funny that we like started off this conversation about our like lukewarm approval of his role as captain von trapp i mean granted he was lauded for it i think at the time but like it's interesting to, to what like i think i think that's just the curse of 60s acting of, like that's just what the 60s looked like if you were like the the male protagonist of a, of a film it is because like like one of the things that the sound of music did at the time was its success basically prompted this like the equivalent of superhero movies and blockbusters 
like musicals became that for a couple of years and then it nearly bankrupt 20th century fox the first time and then like the studios were like nope can't make the musicals anymore that's the reason we got um dr doolittle in the best picture race for 67. i would like to <laughs> just to show how much he like disliked being in being in the sound of music um he there he has a quote here about playing Captain Von Trapp. Although we worked hard enough to make him interesting, it was a bit like flogging a dead horse. The subject matter is not mine. I mean, it can appeal to every person in the world. Which, like, what a trooper to, like, go through with that if he absolutely hated the character. I mean, it is, like, a little bit of, like, an obscure subject matter. I mean, like, and on one hand, like like the 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 underlying notion of, of rejection of the Nazi regime, that's I would hope to be a little bit of like a universal, like we can agree with this to be a good thing. <laughs> I would like to hope that that's the case, but you never know. Um, but I, I think that like the the underlying nature of just um, father alone, unmarried, seven kids, hyper rich, old estate, old money woman who was a nun abandons her religion to be with him who is like the antithesis of of all of her training and ideals i i know it's 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 too much like, like you can't have all of that like you can like rein it in a little bit like like you seven kids on a rich estate like i know it's the 1940s but like come on i would be paying for that like, I kind of like, he didn't have any chemistry with Julie Andrews, but you know what? Like, he didn't have any chemistry with Eleanor Parker either. And like, that's kind of the point. But like, it's just, he had more chemistry with Max. Good old cousin Mac, or Uncle Max. We kind of like mentioned this uh, earlier, um, where uh, Christopher Plummer was convinced to replace Kevin Spacey in All the Money in the World, which ended up uh, winning an award for doing so. Um, there was a meme that was circulating around the time that it was announced called uh, Christopher Plummer replaces Kevin Spacey in everything. Um, and, and it was just it was just going through all of Kevin Spacey roles and photoshopping Christopher Plummer's face onto them. Uh, most notably House of Cards, because um, I was just um, basically like what everyone thinks of Kevin Spacey as being from. Um, <laughs> but it was it, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting meme to think of um when again we kind of think of Christopher Plummer's current roles um as being like secondary secondary roles not not lead character roles um and knowing that like he had won an award as I, I think like every time he's leading in essentially he's won an award like he's won so many awards uh every time that he is leading in in a film and I, I just wonder sometimes like if his um if his career would have even possibly have been even more pro like pro prolific than like we could ever possibly imagine if he had uh, been leading man in every single film that he had ever been in, you know what I mean? It's like, he, he just has like that, that aura about him that I think only comes like once every like three generations of an actor that is just so iconic. Where right? I think, I think uh, Betty White has like that same uh, immortality to her as well, where it's like, yeah. <laughs> Just being fantastic, just um, absolutely synonymous with 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 acting and uh, television acting, and film acting. And, wow, wow, we didn't really talk about any of this television, did we? <laughs> you kind of did a lot of television too, but um, again, kind of like TV mini series. I think he was uh, in a couple episodes of. Uh, <laughs> He was, he was he was a presenter actually on Jeopardy. That was one of the things that um, when they were looking for a replacement for Alex Trebek, um, he had hosted an episode of Jeopardy. So you can go watch that if you want to see him present clues to you, like his voice and his style, his present presentation. Uh, I remember um, a long time ago on the Cosby Show, he was a Shakespearean actor in an episode of the Cosby Show where they talk about Shakespeare and try to teach Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> not that uh, maybe this is like a good example <laughs> of, of a show, of a good show now. Um, it's just it's very, not aged very well, that show. Um, but um, yeah, that's it. 
<laughs> I mean, also, it's, like, interesting because his daughter, I mean, Amanda Plummer, has also, like, had, you know, she was in Pulp Fiction. She was in Joe versus the Volcano. Like, I think, like, it's interesting that she's chosen a similar career. I mean, I don't think she's been anything recently, but, you know, I, it it goes to show, I think, like, she has hopefully like followed his path of just sort of being everywhere but also not being noticed but being incredibly noticed I don't know it, it takes talent to be that kind of factor when when she dies in the hunger games I cried like I like I was going through some shit at that time and then just old lady just giving herself up to be eaten by the the mist I was like no you remind me of my grandma too much this is too real yeah. Wow. Totally forgot she was in Hunger Games, but yeah, like I think I didn't realize that was her until I was like Amanda Plummer. Oh my God, it's you. So yeah. Yeah. That's very uh, like her dad. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm like scrolling through Amanda Plummer's like filmography, and she's she's been in a lot. Like she started in the '80s and hasn't really stopped. I'm honestly really impressed, actually. <laughs> Oh, we should probably tell you. You can find all of Christopher Plummer's movies on various streaming services like Disney Plus, because media consolidation is a terrible thing, except for when it comes to streamers. Because that 20th Century Fox classic is on Disney Plus now. Uh, well, I think, and he's also probably going to be on Paramount Plus, considering <laughs> the Star Trek movies are moving there. Yeah, he, he's he's literally everywhere. I mean, you can you can find him on anything. Um, I think I think Amanda Plummer's works are a little bit more like you're not going to find Pulp Fiction on Disney Plus. I would hope, but <laughs> maybe maybe not quite yet. Um, but maybe in the near future. Um, but um, yes, that is, that is it. Although I guess okay, okay. I actually I take that back. You can find one of Amanda Plummer's films on Disney Plus. <laughs> And it is the anim the animated Hercules film. I forgot she was in that. And I like looked and yes, she was. Wait, what was she? She was Clotho. <laughs> Which is not pronounced like that. It's spelled like Clotho, but I think it's like the Greek Clotho. <laughs> so. <laughs> How would you say that in French now? Oh, we say that in French, I need to go to bed. <laughs> That's it for our show this week. Thank you for listening and for your support. Please subscribe to the show on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram at Cineposium and on Twitter at Cposium to keep up with our updates and to keep in communication with us. Until next week, take care, everyone. <laughs>